So in a moment of humor, I look around, I don't recognize anybody in the audience. Uh, one, two, great, two people. Brilliant. Uh, therefore, uh, I can say pretty much anything and can't call me on it, which is even better. So first of all, it turns out there's a huge monitor down there so I can see what's on the screen up there. That's good, but there isn't a monitor that shows my notes, which is not so good. Eh, let me look at it. I can look at that. So, uh, today's talk is about syntax and uh, it's basically inspired by the syntax wars. So, just a couple of quick show of hands here. A primary language, Java. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Primary language, Erlang. Yeah, Joe raises his hand back there. Um, that was a surprise. Uh, Python, Ruby. Wow, lots of Rubies. Uh, how about something weird, APL? Zero. It's pretty cool. Anyhow, a reasonable smattering of people, C or C variants. There are a bunch. Okay. So, pretty much all of you pretty much have gone through some variation of the syntax for this sucks, or the syntax for that sucks, or, well, you know, syntax basically sucks. And you invariably end up with the syntax flame wars. In fact, a pretty good way to troll pretty much any mailing list. And I can guarantee you to troll the Erlang mailing lists is just say something about syntax and you know off you go. Half the uh, for those of you who are going to be watching, who, who, who are going to listen to Jose talk tomorrow about the Elixir, half the trolls about the Erlang versus Elixir thing going on is syntax. It's got nothing to do with anything else. Looks like Ruby. That's bad. That's good. Whatever. And that kind of inspired this whole thing. So, we're going to get started there. Before that, a bit about myself. I'm Mahesh Paulini Subramania. I head up software for a company called Ubiquity Networks. Is there anybody here who doesn't know me who knows what Ubiquity Networks is or has heard of us? Anybody? Wow. That's zero. Uh, we are the largest network hardware manufacturer that you've clearly never heard of. We're huge, we're worldwide, we're you know, a multi-billion, many, many billion dollar company and we are not responsible for the Wi-Fi in this building. That you should know. Because if it were, it would be working perfectly. Um, anyhow, I head up software for this company, we provide hardware services and just insert some marketing spear about how great we are and whatever, good enough. Moving on, syntax. Syntax flame wars. Syntax flame wars pretty much suck, but they're a great way to troll. The thing is, usually you either get syntax matters or you get this other one, which is syntax doesn't matter. And the thing is, syntax actually doesn't matter except when it does, <laughs> which is kind of like a really simple way of putting it. But the thing is, it's not really the point. And I'm kind of going to get, I'm kind of going to get into this from the perspective of language. And for the next, oh, 30, maybe 40 minutes, I want you to think about syntax, not really from a programming perspective, but from a language perspective. Just think of programming as yet another language. Spoken language is what I mean. Uh, one more question, and that's it. I'm done after this one. Um, how many of you speak more than one language? This is zero. Most of you should. Uh, if I did this in America, how many of you speak more than one language in America? Uh, you get usually somewhere between 10 and 20% of the audience. The tech conference, you usually get a lot more, between 30 and 50, because you have a lot of Indians in tech conferences in America, which pretty much helps. If you take the Indians out, it goes boom, back down to zero. It's really quite bad. So, you speak multiple languages, you're a polyglot, you kind of instinctively know it. You just speak these languages because you grew up speaking these languages. The thing about languages, spoken languages, is syntax is pretty much a reflection of that language. It's a reflection of the culture that brought that language about and can screw you up pretty badly. 
But example number one, that's a language called Kannada. Is there a point here? Ooh, yes, uh, read one. There, that's a language called Kannada, and it's pronounced, uh, anybody here, any Indians, any South Indians? Any Indians? Zero. South Indians, obviously zero. Uh, that's a script based on an old pre-Sanskrit language that dates back to some pre-Sanskrit days. It's still used. Um, that's pronounced Hurli. But it's written H-U-L-I, Hurli, because you don't have this weird la sound in English. It doesn't exist. And Hurli basically means sour, you know, like lemons. It's actually a wee bit more complicated. There are variations of this, but just stick with that. It's sour. There's another thing, Hurli, which is also written H-U-L-I, because there is no L sound, which is a Thai word. The thing is, it looks different in, the syntax here is different. In English, the syntax is the same damn thing. <coughs> which, quite frankly, if you open the fridge because you wanted a couple of lemons and you had the wrong thing in the fridge, would be a very bad idea. Then again, the question is, why do you have a tiger in the fridge? <laughs> or alternately, why do you have lemons in the fridge? You're not supposed to put them in the fridge, keep them outside. But either way, the point is, Huli and Huli are two completely different things, but not in English. It's a, it just doesn't work that way. But that's a simple one. It's just, here's a letter that doesn't exist in English, therefore the syntax is incapable of expressing that very specific phoneme, the l sound. Slightly more complicated. That thing is pronounced kara, K-H-A-R-A. Simple, easy. And it is the flavor of chilies, you know, hot. How do you do that in English? You don't. You just say it's hot, or you say it's chilly hot, or you say something like that. Which, or it's spicy hot, which is my favorite stupid phrase ever. Like, what do you mean spicy hot? You know, it's like, oh, uh, yeah, it's hot. But then again, the point is, this particular word is a thing that doesn't even exist in another, in English. But it's a word that exists in hell, a whole bunch of other languages, Spanish, simple, and so on and so forth. Take this yet another step further. That is a word, sankocha, which actually has no translation in English. It is a very contextual word, <coughs> word and it roughly translates to um, that particular sensation of shyness when you are, okay, how about this? You are at a friend's house, and the person says, here, have seconds, I know you like, it's a great dessert, have seconds. And you're sitting there and you're like, yeah, but I don't want to take seconds because that would not be the polite thing to do. Now, they know you're being polite. You know you're being polite. They know you know you're being polite. That particular sensation is called some culture in Canada. I'm serious, I'm not making this up. <laughs> now, I could do exactly what I did. I could go through this entire you know, description of what this means and say, please don't feel that way. Or if you're in South India, in Bangalore, you'd say, uh, which roughly translates to, don't feel Sankocha. And it explains everything. It covers a good two minutes of description of what I'm trying to say. Syntax. Effective, remarkably useful thing in that one particular case. Now, of course, in other cases, it's Canada, which basically stopped evolving in one sense uh, about 150 years ago. Get to that in just a moment. But the point being that the actual syntax that you're using, the actual letters that you're using, are really relevant based upon the particular situation you're trying to get at. So far, so good. Applies to programming languages, too. Monads. Yeah, fine, we know what that is, right? Not going to say it, anybody, you know, whatever. You know what a monad is. What's a monad in Visual Basic? Well, yeah, I know, there's some, I bet there's some smart aleck in the room going, yeah, you can do monads in Visual Basic. Well, yeah, you can, but it's kind of a stupid thing to do. And, I mean, but you could. It's go-to in Haskell. Again, you could do one in Haskell. In fact, 
I just found one in the stack exchange because everything's on stack, stack exchange. But still, the point is, you can do a go-to in Haskell. Again, a remarkably stupid thing to do, but you could do it. But the context, the point behind this is the specifics of the syntax, even those simple words, go to, which is an actual syntactical term in basic, can be, mean, you know, diddly squat in a different program, programming language. Or the word monad just totally encapsulates everything that you're trying to say, but means absolutely nothing in basic. Which kind of takes me back to this thing, which is in the end, it's about the language you're using, or the language you're speaking, or the language you're programming, which kind of takes me back all the way back, which is what on earth is a language? What do we mean when we say language? When somebody's complaining about the syntax or the structure of a particular piece of code, what are they arguing about? If you're trying to tell somebody that you know they don't talk so good, or some even more ungrammatical version thereof, what exactly is your point? Seriously, what is your point when you say that? You know speak English good, great. I know either, whatever. The point is, languages are these insanely complex beasties which people have been trying to do some kind of categorization about forever. They've been trying to classify these things forever. There's like a million ways in which you classify languages, spoken languages, start with a simple one. Everybody's seen some goofy version of this thing. Uh, the language tree, it all began with Proto-Indo-European languages and stuff happened. Which is not actually quite true because it also the Proto-Native uh, American stuff and there's other stuff out in the Far East and whatever, things that came from the River Valley civilizations. It doesn't matter, there's old stuff. There's totally other, different ways of doing it. Chomsky and Schutzenberger did this, Yeoman's work in linguistics, to figure out, to basically do this classification of languages in, let's not go there, it exists. It can actually get incredibly complicated and goofy. The thing about all of this though is, no matter how complicated and tricky you can make language classifications, there's somebody who will make it even more complicated and even trickier and even more difficult to understand, guaranteeing PhDs for generations to come. And the thing is, it's not just that. This is all exceedingly small print. It is a chart of the history of programming languages. And most, pretty much anybody who went through one of the, this thing in small print would find half a dozen languages they know that's not on this chart. Because, you know, somebody's coming up with a new one every day. Somebody finds an old one that nobody ever adopted a while back, which isn't on that chart. But the point is there is some level of classification that you try to do saying this came from that and that came from something else and that came from something else, whatever. Life is good. Or maybe you try and classify things differently. You talk about structures. Um, stupid example, because there are a lot of stupid examples here. What's that thing? It's a green car, right? So far so good. So it turns out another way of classifying languages is by structure. You say there are left branching languages and right branching languages. Left branching languages, because I always get the one mixed up. Um, in a left branching language, you put the descriptor before the term. That's a green car. Green car, left branching. In Italian, macchina verde. That's a car, green. Italian is a right branching language, so is Spanish, so it's basically a lot of the uh, Latin based languages. So far so good, right branching. Uh, most Indian languages, most Southeast Asian languages are left branching. In fact, they're hardcore left branching. It's like virtually impossible to find any right branching stuff in it. You always end up with the descriptor before the term. There's some goofy African, I shouldn't say goofy, there's some African languages and some obscure languages that are purely right branching. Purely right branching to the extent that you don't say one car, you say car one. Seriously, you do say, it's a language, it's fine, what are we talking? English, of course, is the goofy one. It's like all over the place. There's some left branching stuff, there's some right branching stuff. 
English has caused more chaos than you can shape so many states at. Hold that thought. I'm going to get back to that one. You can do the same with programming languages. That's a really obvious one. You got imperative and declarative and declarative and logic and functional. Oh, this looks so nice, right? You can do this and you can end up with this perfect thing. It's a lambda calculus based language and life is perfect, except it's not really. Shush me. Because what you end up with is even though you'd like to believe that your languages can be nicely classified into left branching or right branching or whatever the equivalent is, they're all like English. Java now has pretty much everything in it. And if it doesn't, it will be after tomorrow. Pick a language. It's pretty much got terms like pretty much any other language, except APA, which is ununderstandable, but that's a separate issue anyway. But the point remains that in the end, yes, you can sit around and you can classify the language 70s way, 17 ways to Sunday, and nobody's ever going to come to you and say, yup, that is the perfect language. That is the perfect syntax. That's the correct way to do things because that depends upon what you learned, where you came from, what you did, what you speak, which is not what I learned, where I came from, what I do, what I speak. Because in the end, there are billions and billions of people out there, whatever the current number is, five and a half, all of whom speak languages, all of whom speak different languages, all of whom do it differently, and they all seem to do it remarkably successfully at that. By the way, same with programming languages. Pick your programming language of choice. Erlang, greatest language ever, except when it's not. And insert Erlang, just insert language of choice. It, it's a function of who you're talking to and what they're doing and so on, which I'll get to in a moment. The thing is, got billions of people, a huge chunk of them are multilingual. By the way, when I say multilingual, you shouldn't just think about they speak multiple languages. They might code in multiple languages too. But stick with the speaking thing for a moment. You got people who are multilingual. Great. How do you communicate with them? The thing that you tend to forget is there are a couple of different ways of doing it. One is the obvious one. Just put up signs in all the languages you know. The other option is just give it a good shot because people will figure it out anyhow. Usually. Sometimes. Not always. What's that mean? Well, it's pretty obvious. It's wrong, but it's obvious, right? You know what it means. You're not going to walk over to this one, look at that, and go, huh. That's not an authorized reseller. I'm going to go somewhere else. Works. Poor grammar. Like you give a shit. Either that or maybe you don't give a shit. You get a park and you get a speeding ticket. One or the other. But the point is, you knew what that meant when you saw that. Kids in particular tend to be exceptionally good at this. Because the thing is, the important thing here is we all learn languages differently, but when you're young, you don't really know or care that much about the rules. You get the rules from your parents or from your surroundings. Effectively, what happens is when you're a kid, you look at the stuff and you're like, oh, okay, fine, I know what's going on. I know what this is supposed to be. You pick up hopefully questions glass of water and you say glass of water, and you say water glass, or you say glass water, or you say meter, which is Hindi, aqua, whatever. Pick your language of choice. In Bukhari, the aqua, Italian. But the point being, you got the point across to somebody. More importantly, you explain what that thing was. Unless you're the US, of course, because in the US, nobody speaks more than one language. Nobody. Take it a step further. Um, we're going to go into a very unscientific study in just a moment. But um, one of the amazing things is when you learn multiple languages, when you learn to speak multiple languages, 
you instinctively break down a certain set of barriers in your brain. You become more amenable to looking at the world in different ways. This is actually, this isn't me, this is Chomsky, and this is people before Chomsky, but language is a deeper reflection of not just brain structures, but of the culture that the language is created in. Remember Sun culture? I guess there's a lot of politeness in Bangalore once upon, in India once upon a time, in South India. A particular type of politeness that required the creation of that one word, some culture, to really hammer home the point as to what is going on. And I suspect that didn't exist in the, well, pick a totally different culture in Norwegian. The thing is, what I just said for spoken languages applies exactly to programming languages too. And odds are, if you speak multiple spoken languages and you code, you're much more open to multiple programming languages. And this is kind of the point behind the unscientific study. The extremely unscientific study that I conducted, and I've said that for the last time, <coughs> basically went through a whole bunch of people that I know, which makes it unscientific, and said, and just, did a cor correlation between the polyglots and the polyglot programmers. And there's a straight 60% cor correlation between those two. What is even more fascinating was there's an 80% correlation between mon monolinguals. English, Java, English, Java, English, Java. Now mind you, that could also be because they're all in the US and all they need is Java and that's a separate story altogether. But the point is that does tend to apply in both spoken and programming languages in that when you are so fixated on one way of looking at the world, you tend to just avoid any other way of looking at things. The, going back to kids though, or going back to the way people learn languages, the way you learn languages varies depending upon what it is that you're learning can vary drastically for that matter. You know Italian. To go is undoubted. So far, so good. In Hindi, a rough appro approximation would be jhana. This thing means absolutely nothing to you. There are no preconceptions. You, are, you know Italian. You want to learn Hindi. It could be gibberish. It is gibberish to you to learn but you're walking in there with your mind open and you can pick it up pretty rapidly doing that. The interesting thing about this one though is you will learn Hindi extremely well, assuming you do. Because part of the learning is, it will, part of the point behind learning it is you will understand a lot about the culture, about the way it's spoken, the people that you speak it with, how you speak it, etc., etc. because you're not bringing any of these preconceptions with you at all. It looks different. Sounds stupid, but just the fact that it looks different means you treat it differently. We're human. We tend to be that way. We don't like, well, okay, not like. We tend to interact differently with people who are not like us, whatever that means. Third and last APL reference here. Gorgeous chunk of APL there. Nobody knows APL, so I'll explain. That's what you use to multiply two polynomials together. Gibberish, right? But the thing is, this piece of code, if you wrote this out in pick your language of choice, that's not APL or a variant thereof like J or Q or something, this would be like pages and pages and pages and pages and some more pages of code. But, and it would probably take you about a week to write in Java. Probably take you a week to write this too. Just because it's short doesn't mean it's easy. But the point there being that it is so different. When you learn APL, you learn APL. As compared to this, French and Italian. Oh, they look quite similar. In fact, they are similar. And in fact, you know what? If you know Italian, you can learn French or Spanish pretty rapidly. Because they look quite similar. 
which is a different way of learning languages, and it's also the same reason why when you look, when you know C, when you know Java, you can pick up C sharp. Humanly, but yes, you can. They kind of roughly look the same, except for all the .NET entertainment. They do, but there can also be a problem there. You see these two, and for a moment, pretend it's me. I'm Amer I'm American. I don't know anything other than English. Say, hey, yeah, look, that's an A, an N, a D, an A. This is English. These are words in English. I'm bringing in all my preconceptions from English into this. So for the moment, pretend English, actually not pretend, a large chunk of English is left branching. Remember that? Green car. So when I see the green car and I'm speaking in Italian, I won't say macchina verde, I'll say verde macchina which people will actually understand, people do understand because I speak cartoon Italian. But the point being that it's not correct Italian, it's not even remotely correct Italian. That's because I just assume that since this looks like English, whatever that means, the English rules apply to it. The English methodology applies to it. Which is what, this is where syntax can screw you up. This one won't screw you up. This is Visual Basic. It's easy to understand. Hell, it looks like English, right? Whatever. This is Microsoft Excel Ease. It's barely English. It's totally non-functional. It's one of the most frightening things in the world. Uh, why is it? Brief aside, you know why it's one of the most frightening things in the world? There is a website that I strongly recommend that you guys go take a look at. It's called the European Spreadsheet Risk Group. Just Google it find it. It's just a list of all the monster catastrophes that have occurred because of Microsoft Excel errors. The latest is, of course, the Rygar Ronoff thing, thing that basically took down, has taken down Europe, one spreadsheet error, but uh, JP Morgan lost $6 billion because of one of those, and so on and so forth. But it's because it's this. It's totally cryptic, ununderstandable. Unless you know Microsoft Excel stuff, but even then it's not, but that's a separate story. Take it a step further then. You look at this and you say to yourself, eh, not quite sure what it means. It's F sharp. Basically a list comprehension in F sharp. Easy, simple. If you know that it's a list comprehension and you understand that I and L means L is a list and whatever, so far so good. So yeah, there's some functional ease that comes into it and you get a little bit more of a context. But theoretically, if you approach this and you know a little bit about functional programming, you can jump into this with all your preconceptions. You're looking at this and you're saying, hey, this is just like C-sharp. It's not, but you say to yourself, it's just like C-sharp. And you write these reams of imperative code and life gets horrible. If you ever run into Adam Granich, just ask him about this. He'll go on for hours. Same thing in Erlang. Totally incomprehensible. <laughs> All right, makes sense to me. Makes sense to Joe back there and a couple others that are up uh, here. But to most of you, it's totally pointless. But this is just like the APL thing that I mentioned. You see this, you don't understand what's going on. So you don't assume things about it that are not true. Or that are true, whatever. You don't make any assumptions. In this case, the syntax matters. It tells you a lot about exactly what's going in there without having you take any wrong turns. The thing is, to take this a step further, a lot of what we do when we speak is about error correction. This Part of the context behind the syntax being the way it is, is so that you don't make any errors in interpreting this thing. You could here, I'm not saying you will, but you could. Here it's much less likely. The thing is, and I keep saying the thing is, when I said natural languages are like programming, programming languages, they're not really. I mean, they kind of are. From a Chomsky, Schutzenberger perspective, they are. But in reality, not so much. Spoken languages are brilliant at error correction. 
See that? You can read it. It's one of those goofy things about the way humans read. All we care about is the first letter and the last letter. We don't care about anything in between the two. We just have a rough idea of what the words are. Try making a mistake in syntax in any program that you're writing. You don't even get to the point where it runs and then the compiler just puts it out immediately and says, hey, you got a syntax error here. The thing about errors though, and this has a lot to do with programming in a moment, errors lead to evolution. For those of you who, who may have attended Garrett's talk on softwares like biology, errors are necessary for an ecosystem to evolve, for systems to evolve, for creatures, creatures to evolve. Spoken languages are rife with errors. They're all over the place. That thing's a telephone, though, you know. Well, okay, that is a telephone, believe it or not, for those of you who are younger than whatever. But that's a telephone. The thing about telephone, um, do you know what the Kannada word for telephone is? Kannada is the South Indian language. It's not telephone. It's telephone new. About a hundred and something odd years ago, people in that state basically said, Screw it, we're not making up words because they'd make up words for different terms when they showed up, you know, just like in any other language, and different people would have different words for the same thing. It was getting incredibly complicated. So they just started sticking U's at the end of everything. Seriously, telephone new, uh, pointer root. I bet it would be called a pointer root. Even to the point now where even words that have words in Canada, you can perfectly ex you can express perfectly well by seeing a U at the end of it. A very common verbal tick in Canada is noun verb madu, M A D U, which roughly translates to verb the noun. Or, so, for example, um, computer on madu, turn on the computer. Light off madu, turn off the light. But the weird thing is the people that understand this don't understand English. I'm serious. My wife was in, where was she? A uh, small town in the middle of Karnataka, state in the south of India, in the middle of nowhere. Checks into the hotel, the room is dead cold, she looks around, she can't find the air conditioner uh, thermostat. So there's a bellhop dude is in there and she says, hey, how do I turn off the air conditioner? And the guy goes, so she tries a couple of variations and gets absolutely that. And she says, and I quote, air conditioner off Marty. And the guy goes, oh, okay. And he goes and turns it off. And again, this is a case where the syntax matters. She had to put it in that particular sequence for him to go, oh, she's speaking Canada. I understand her. But if she said, turn off the air conditioner, he was like, I have no idea what you're saying. God forbid, she said, how do I turn off the air conditioner? Which to him sounded like blah, 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 air conditioner, blah, 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 blah. Syntax matters. The way you structure the things matter. It causes, a, it causes languages to evolve. You now have this entire thing, now word Manu, that never existed in Canada more than 100 years ago. Now it exists. It's part of the language. The goofy thing about this is, this applies to programming languages too. Evolution exists everywhere. I mean, pretty obvious stuff. Java version 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. They keep throwing more stuff in the kitchen sink than God knows what into Java, and eh, it's evolving. Same with any other language. Pick a language that's got new stuff in it. There's like 47 versions of Haskell, for crying out loud. Each is brilliant, but each is kind of like quasi orthogonal to the other one. But it exists, and it's great. The weird thing about programming languages, though, is they evolve very slowly because they don't accept errors in syntax. They only accept errors in requirements, which is, I guess, a good thing, but still. Except for one variation thereof, scripting languages. Perl is probably one of, the, well, used to be one of the most dynamic languages out there. 
for two reasons. One is when people added stuff to Perl, they invariably screw something up. Oh, it's awesome. Uh, you see any Perl spec and you wade your way through it, and there's like 47 error conditions and edge cases. And everybody knows what they are. Just crazy. It's, it's a wonderful language in that sense, but part of it is also because Perl is very pragmatic. I mean, it's, you do it, you use it to do things now, like immediately now, not sometime later. Well, you can use it for lots of big complicated things, but the vast majority of the use cases are do something now, get it over with, that way. That kind of a world, errors show up, <coughs> patches show up, new features creep in, but they all tend to be very pragmatic and scripting languages evolve. So in the end, syntax matters. Or maybe it doesn't. I know, I'm kind of going back and forth on this thing. But the point being, syntax matters when it does and it doesn't matter when it doesn't. But the one thing I can pretty much guarantee you is complaining about syntax is a pretty stupid thing. It's a language. The syntax is part of the language. You can't look at the syntax and go, that's wrong, that's the wrong way, it shouldn't be that way. Seriously, it should really not be that way. That is the worst possible thing. English, C-U-T, cut, B-U-T, but, P-U-T, put. What? Why is it not P-U-T, put? Nobody sits there going, well, that's wrong. I, I refuse to accept this. They just go, eh, it's stupid, it's English. But oh, God forbid, there's a semicolon at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the end of the statement. Oh, horror. Who cares? Put the semicolon there. It's a language. Just move on. JavaScript entertainment. <laughs> but the point is, if you f ever find yourself trolling, well, okay. If you find yourself trolling because you wanted to troll, rock on. But if you're trolling because you mean it, you know, it's like, oh, God, no, this, I can't believe you have, like, a fun at the beginning and an end at the end. How come there's no end fun? What? Fun should match with an end fun? Who made you God? You know, somebody out there said, yeah, great, it's fun, it ends with end, and I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the point. Move with it. Begins have ends. Doesn't mean that nothing else can have an end. Right? It's a language. It's the actual specifications of the syntax are probably the least important thing about it. What's important is the concepts that that syntax are used to express. Just look at the text that you put down there and just go, eh, it's just the way that it's expressed. And if you ever wonder why it's a particular, oh, by the way, if something is remarkably stupid, that's okay too. Just say to yourself, C-U-T cut, B-U-T butt, P-U-T put, and move on. All right, so, yeah, it's stupid. I don't care, I'm just using it. To kind of wrap this up, when you're looking at this, when you're looking at a piece of syntax, when you're looking at a troll war, a flame war, something, ask yourself, well, don't ask yourself, don't look at that, just move on. But when you're looking at any kind of discussion or question or commentary or anything about the syntax used in a discussion, ask yourself the following. Who are the parties to the conversation? Because remember, this is a communication, right? Any conversation has two parties unless you're talking to an irredeemable narcissist. You can have two people, person A talking to person B, could be talking to a crowd, a whole bunch of people talk to each other. We talk to a computer, but at the end of the day, you are talking to somebody else. Let's assume you're the party involved here. When you're talking to somebody else, the question is, who is the other person you're talking to? So to you, pick something. Um, Haskell, since I picked on that recently. Haskell is the single greatest thing in the world, and that's what you're going to work in. Awesome, perfect. It's got this elegant syntax, you know, you stay up nights, well, okay, you sleep nights reading about the syntax, whatever. It's great. So you're working, and everybody's using Node.js. What do you do? 
And he said, say, I'm going to use Haskell, and then go look for another job. Or use Node. Seriously, it means it. I mean, it's like, who cares? It's no. Okay, maybe you do care. But the point is, the person at the other end of the conversation, the person that's using Node, your company, your boss, the paycheck, etc., they depend upon that. So it's something you have to ask yourself. You know, what's the point behind what I'm doing? Uh, just to kind of do a little bit of a flip side to this whole thing, though. So you sit there going, hey, you know, I'm a polyglot. I speak many languages. I'm great. I'm awesome. I use the right tool for the job. Any job, I use the right tool. That's how I pack load runners. Because I'm excellent at what I do. The question is, what is the job that you do? Seriously. Who are you talking to? Remember the Node.js bit? Who are you talking to? Who's the person at the other end of the tool chain? How necessary is what it is the thing that you're doing? For example, suppose you need to build something that is dead reliable and just has to work. And once you're done, you're walking away and it just needs to keep running. Write in Erlang. Seriously, write it in Erlang. It'll just run. Move on. Don't write it in Java. It will just run. And then it'll crash. And then somebody will do something. By the way, that's not a knock on Java. That's just a point about origin stories of languages. The language origin story, fault tolerance, reliability, etc., etc. Use our language if you want something to be dead reliable. You want something that has a million other developers that can manage it once you move down, write it in Java. Great, perfect. It'll work and somebody else will manage it for you. That's awesome. The point is, how necessary is it and what are the end conditions? Who are you talking to? You're talking to a Java shop? Write it in Java. You're, writing, you're talking to a Visual Basic job? I mean shop? You know the answer. How quickly do you need it? This can go against the other ones. So it's absolutely the, the right tool for the job in this particular case would be to write it in APL. Seriously. Write it in, or okay, you know what, let's not make fun of APL besides I already did my three references. It's a bunch of statistical stuff, you need to write it in R. That's the right tool for the job here. You don't know R, that's a problem. But it's the right tool for the job, right? Screw that, write it in Perl. You need it this afternoon. It'll work, maybe. It'll get done by this afternoon, almost certainly. As long as that doesn't conflict with the how necessary is it. If your crappy Perl is going to take the bank down because you delivered it this afternoon and it broke, don't write it in Perl, just walk away from the job. But, you know, you need to ask yourself these questions. So when somebody says syntax matters or syntax doesn't matter, that is really, really not the point. Because there is no such thing as correct syntax. There is no such thing as wrong syntax. Syntax just is. It's a part of the language, whatever the language is that you're using. The point is communication. You are trying to get somebody to understand what you're doing, whether that somebody's a computer or somebody else on the other side or you're part of your team or whatever. The specifics of the letters and the terms and the glyphs and whatever you use to write the application that you're writing are the least important part of the thing that you're doing. And when I say the least, I do mean the least important part. If there's one thing I'd like you guys to walk away with from here, it's the fervent, de fervent desire that the next time you see a troll or a syntax or this syntax sucks kind of thing, you just hit delete and you move on. Or you just, you know, close the tab, whatever. It doesn't matter. The troll doesn't matter. The actual syntax matters from the context of the language that you're using. But there is no correctness involved with it. It's kind of like, well actually no, there's no point using an analogy. It just is part of the language. There is no such thing as a good language or a bad language. They're just languages. It's your usage of the language that is important. Stick with that.
And that's my little rant for today. Any questions? Anybody? So it uh, strikes me that a lot of your morally delivered there at the end, it works for languages that already exist and you know customers that are already using it, but there are you know, languages in development, it seems like the argument could still hold for in terms of the, the debate being worthwhile when you're talking amongst a group where one person comes in, comes in saying we need to change this part of the syntax and the argument is because we need to appeal to this certain community over here. Um, do you have any comment? And another person might say no, it's not a, it's a pos a me, it doesn't actually match up in our context. It would be a mistake to adopt that. So I was curious if you have any thoughts on mm, whether it's worth trying to resolve those questions in well, some way. Right, so the question is, for newly, for languages that are developing, when the debate boils down to something like, we need to change the syntax because of reason X, what does one do? And there's a short answer and a long answer, and I'll stick with the short answer here. Um, the specific example given, we need to pick syntax X because it's going to appeal to community Y, is almost certainly a bad idea, unless what you're trying to do is create a language that is going to take board community Y. Um, as Creston mentioned earlier, there's this new language, Erlang like there's this new language called Elixir that's popping up in the Erlang virtual machine, which essentially um, looks like Ruby. And the idea is, well, not Jose's point, but for a lot of people, it's a wonderful thing because it looks like Ruby. But here's the thing. The fact that it looks like Ruby does not mean it is Ruby. The fact that it looks like Ruby does means anybody who comes in thinking it is Ruby is going to hit something that is not Ruby. So what you can end up with is a system where you've got a whole bunch of people writing Ruby on the Erlang virtual machine. Which is great for Ruby, but it's terrible from an Erlang perspective. And by the way, when I say Erlang perspective, I don't mean Erlang the language, but I mean Erlang the concept. I want to write reliable, stable, fault-tolerant systems. You're not going to get it magically writing Elixir, or Erlang for that matter, but you're certainly not getting it writing Ruby. slightly different way of responding to exactly that point, which is to take away the, I want to appeal to that community part of things, is syntax debates from a language perspective are age old. They've always happened, they always will happen. People are still complaining about what is correct English, what's proper English, how the accent you should speak English in. So when we talk about programming languages, the way things tend to get added is over time, and I mean seriously over time. The next revision of Ruby is going to contain foo. It's like awesome, the next revision, that's next year, or six months or whatever. Fine, duke it out. That, I, neither I nor you should actually have an issue with. That you'd be more than happy to argue about, because that is, if anything, I'd say a functional debate, as in these are actual capabilities you want to add to the system. To me, that is more redolent of the word for telephone in Canada. I want to say telephone new. Great, awesome. Rock on, move on. Or everybody decides that uh, as of tomorrow, every single government document is not going to say computer, it's going to say, uh, what's a French, d'ordinateur or something like that? Yeah, d'ordinateur. Which is awesome. You made up a word that says computer and you slammed it in, and through sheer force of market, well, government marketing, or people marketing, you've got it used in the language. Party. Bit of a non answer, but it is a bit of a non topic for that matter. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. So oh, let's give my hatred some applause. Thank you.